Hey everybody, we're back. Hello. Episode 13. Uh, we just thought uh, we would do uh, this episode on our daughter and how it's been dropping her off at college. She's been gone for a month already. Yeah. So uh, as everybody knows, a pandemic. A month and five days. A month and five days, if we're counting. We are counting. <laughs> uh, and just the uncertainty of how it was going to be once we dropped her off at a large university how she would fare, you know, just starting the whole college thing with all the restrictions and things that you had to do in the protocols. Uh, but so far, so good. Yeah, um, it's been a little um, unnerving. We've been a little um, worried about it. But uh, so we dropped her off on so uh, August 17th. And um, uh, we did our podcast or whatever you want to call it, our video um, about that on the 27th of August. So it was about 10 days later. And and at that point, um, she had just started classes. Mm -hmm. The first week of class was the week of August 24th. Um, And things are really going well. You know, everybody seemed to be complying. And there was, you know, all the testing going on that we talked about in the last episode. And then came the first weekend after the first week of class, right? So now everyone's on campus and everyone has a week of class under their belts. And uh, things went a little haywire. Yeah. There may or may not have been some unauthorized parties. Right, <laughs> right. There were some violations of the rules. There was a fraternity party, at least one. There were some you know, private house parties off of campus uh, where kids weren't necessarily playing by the rules. No. Our daughter was not part of any of that. No. Or so we are told. <laughs> uh, but but uh, so what interesting thing happened was when the kids went back to their testing routine the following week. Um, Shocker. The positive <laughs> cases spiked. I shouldn't laugh. I mean, it's it's unfortunate. But so, you know, that, that first weekend was the 29th and 30th of August when kids went back and started getting tested on Monday the 30th and Tuesday the 31st. The number of cases the number of new cases was much higher than we'd seen before that. So I'm just looking at this sort of online dashboard they have that tracks all of this at the University of Illinois. So they started all the testing back in July, like July 6th after the 4th of July holiday. Um, you know, the number of cases stayed pretty low. The, the positivity rate was pretty low. Very low. You know, it, it went up a little bit when kids started coming back to campus, as you'd expect. But that week following the first week of classes, it dramatically spiked. Uh, the positivity rate in the Champaign-Urbana community as a whole had been around 1%. So it was really great. They were really doing a great job even before kids came back to campus keeping it under control in the local community. Unfortunately, um, after that weekend of partying, it started to spike. So on uh, just as an example, on Tuesday, which would have been um, September 1st, I guess, um, the number of positive cases approached 250, new cases, 250. The next day, it was right around 200. And the positivity rate went from around 1% to almost 3%. Um, so that caused the university to clamp down. Put on the brakes. <laughs> yeah, they hit the brakes. So from September 2nd, starting in September 2nd, for a two-week period, they all had to, all the students had to stay in their rooms um, or their apartments or wherever they were living, stay indoors except for things like getting exercise, going to class, Going, going to, the, to get food. Going to the grocery store, going to get food. Yeah, that sort of thing. And they couldn't really, they couldn't so, they couldn't um, socialize with anyone other than their roommate. Right. Um, since obviously, you know, they're, they're living with that person. Um, and that was kind of tough because, uh, you know. I actually wasn't even thinking about this, but for the kids who chose to have, be in a single dorm room, that would have been even worse. Yeah, they, they would have be been like, li- you know, literally just by themselves. Yeah. So that was kind of a shock to um, Claire's system, to say the least. But she, when she got to campus, she kind of found her way and, you know, joined some clubs, met some people. Uh, there's music studios in their dorm, in the basement, or on the first floor of her dorm. So um, she can practice music and she met some ki- other kids who like music. So that's been fun for her. 
and uh, but also to have a taste of freedom and be able to do stuff and then have that taken away is also kind of a hardship. Right. So they were having meals over Zoom. You yeah. Know, they'd all go get their food and, <laughs> and sit down at their computers or phones or whatever and, yeah. and, and eat together, whereas before that they were actually gathering because the weather was so nice. Oh, my gosh, yeah. So they could just sit out on the lawn. Right. They go out There's like the a car. little picnic area by her dorm so they could um, hang out there if they wanted to called The Grove, I believe. Right. Uh, so, yeah, that two-week period was kind of hard. Um, but then uh, as things progressed and kids were staying, uh, following the rules, then they kind of brought some privileges back. Right. So that began on September 2nd and was supposed to run through the 16th. Um, so I guess that would have been a, a Wednesday to a Wednesday. Um But this, I think on the Sunday before that, uh, before that expired, um, they were told that, you know, things are going well, the positivity rate and new cases were all the way down. So they were allowed to, uh, between that Sunday and the time they lifted the restrictions, they were able to socialize with one person other than their roommate, and they had a little bit more flexibility and leeway. So And you could hang out with your roommate and plus each of friends, so you could have four people at right. the same time together. So that was... A little bit better. That made it a lot, well, yeah, and I would, a lot better maybe an exaggeration, but it was a lot better. But, you know, um, it, this, this really did um, work to get the situation under control. I mean, who knows what the future holds, obviously. But they went from, you know, they spiked around, as I said, around 3% positivity rate, and they were averaging a little over 200 new cases a day for a couple of days. It went way down. Um, between then and now, so between the beginning of September and, and today, um, they still, you know, they have a few positive cases every day, a few new cases, as, as you'd expect. You, you wouldn't expect it to be zero, but the positivity rate is all the way down to about a half a percent. That's insane. So it was That's around, so yeah, it was around 1% when the kids uh, were arrived on campus hovered around there for a few days. It spiked to about 3%, but now it's down to about half a percent. So this rigorous testing program and the restrictions really does, you know, the, all these things really seem to make a big difference. And how many how many tests have they done so far? Well, this, is, this is pretty wild. So since um, uh, July 6th, so right after the 4th of July holiday, there were people on campus. There were, you know, some of the athletes who were going to be participating in fall sports were coming back and things like that. So from July 6th through now, they conducted over 360,000 tests uh, on campus. Now, that's, you know, obviously a lot of it is multiple people, right. you know, the same people being tested multiple times, of course. Yeah, because the kids have to get tested twice a week. So Right. But there, I, uh, the chancellor, uh, um, early in this process, when kids were just back on campus, so sometime between the, like the 17th and the 24th of August, the chancellor had said on so one social media platform or another that U of I accounted for something like 2.7% of all of the tests conducted in the entire nation yeah. on a daily basis. Um, so that's, that's pretty remarkable. Um, but yeah, they've done a good job. They've modified the testing a little bit now. They have to get you know, they, the undergraduates still have to get tested twice a week, but they try to have them stick to a schedule so that the testing doesn't get backlogged. Right. They have, it's a rapid result test, but if everyone's going on the same days and at the same time. You might have to wait a couple of days. Yeah. They, so now, for instance, you know, you can go on, say, a Monday and a Thursday, Tuesday and Friday or Wednesday, and then either Saturday or Sunday. Right. So they try to have them keep to that type of schedule. They also modified it so that um, faculty, staff, and graduate students only have to be tested once a week, but the undergraduates still have to be tested twice a week. So for, with that results, obviously we feel much better about um, her being there. And they were serious when they had the parent uh, Zoom before we dropped her off that said, we are going to take care of your children. We promise we're going to do everything in yeah. our power to make it safe for your kids to be at school. And I think they've done a remarkable job. And, you know, kids will get suspended if they break the rules. Oh, yeah. You know, the kids who organize no, um, these parties. There's did. no second chance. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, the second chance, they're not expelled, they're suspended. But right. Well, yeah, that's true. They're, they're, they're completely <laughs> lose out. But, uh, you know, but they do take it seriously and they do enforce it. Um, and the, you know, there are local ordinances also. If kids violate a uh, Champaign or Urbana ordinance, they can be fined by the local community right. too. So um, it was a little nerve-wracking when it spiked, and, um, but uh, it's good to see they've gotten it under control. One of the things that, that is a little bit concerning about the future is that, of course, you may have heard that they are bringing football back. Um, initially, over the summer, they'd sort of gone back and forth on it. And then ultimately, the Big Ten Conference uh, uh, voted not to, to, you know, just to cancel the... Well, I shouldn't say cancel. I think what they did was they, want, they, they were going to um, put it over to the spring and try to right. f- like regroup in the spring and have some sort of a season then. But last week, <laughs> they reversed course and decided um, they are now going to have uh, an eight-game football season starting in uh, October, which is a little nerve-wracking. Um, apparently, they're going to start October 24th and go for eight weeks into like mid-December. But it's interesting because the oh, so the first game is October 24th, so they're going to have four games while kids are still on campus. And then all the kids go home, all the other kids go home, and right. they'll have four more games on essentially empty campuses. So they're going to have games October 24th and 31st, and then the 7th and 14th of November, everyone will still be on campus. Then at least at U of I, and I think at most schools, everybody goes so home too. November 20th, so the next game will be November 21st and then into December. So they're going to. Have, that's going to be a little strange to have games on campus where – the students are largely all gone. Right. Although I think you did mention that they are not going to have fans, right? Uh, certainly that's the case at U of I. Um, that decision they had made, I think even before the Big Ten initially canceled the, the um, season, they, they went kind of back and forth on it. At one point they were going to limit capacity to 20%. Then I think they decided no fans, and then the Big Ten canceled the season, and then it came back. Yeah. I think they're sticking with no fans. I, I don't know. I hope they do. I don't know about other um, you know, campuses, other schools. I mean, some of these stadiums are gigantic. Yeah. Um, Even U of I st- is really big. Yeah, it holds somewhere between sixty and 70,000. But, you know, like University of Michigan is, I don't know, 105,000. I think it's basically the largest That's so crazy. in college football. Yeah. So you could have 15 people go, and then they could just sit <laughs> yeah. around the edge. That's it. Well, we are a little bit worried with all the traveling. You know, it's, it's going to be extremely hard to control the spread um, for example, you know, I, I read w- within the last couple of weeks that the entire LSU football team w- tested positive. The whole team. Yeah. I mean, you know, granted, I, you know, presumably they were not serious cases. Um, but still. <laughs> but still. Um, there have been multiple cases. You know, Notre Dame just had to cancel um, the, at least this coming game because of a number of kids testing positive. So and, – and there have been some kids who have tested positive and have had real – Side effects. There have been kids who've had actual heart issues as a result. I mean, I'm well, talking about athletes, football players. The thing is, like, players. you know, it's even though some kids are getting it, it's not just that, but it's the lingering effects afterwards that right. can prevent them if they're good enough to go to the NFL or, you know, lead a normal, healthy, active life, you know. And the potential that, you know, going back and forth between, I mean, our guys aren't necessarily going to be traveling all over the country, but they are going to be traveling all over the Midwest. And, you know, there's some risk that. Even in the best circumstances, a football player or a coach gets exposed, brings it back to campus, un- unknowingly exposes students in their class or, or you know, people there in the same dorm or fraternity with or something like that. Right. And I personally also worry about, you know, the local community. I mean, all of these schools are in communities where people live year round. Right. They're not, they're, they don't just drop a college campus in the middle of nowhere. There's and we a have whole friends that live there. Community. So, um, right. Right. Concerned about them too. So, you know, I do think, I do think they've sort of, they've taken the University of Illinois approach to the testing and, you know, I think they're, you know, going to, going to be as cautious as possible. But I, there's no perfect way to control it. And the more traveling, you know, the greater likelihood that kids will get exposed and spread. So it, it, it is concerning. Definitely. And we've had, um, you know, it's been an adjustment to having Claire not here since we had her all summer. Uh, if it had been a normal summer, she would have been working, hanging out with friends and everything. So we had the luxury of 
um, seeing her. Uh, so we definitely miss her and can't wait to pick her up. But if you have kids at college, and let us know how your guys are doing and your fairing. And I'll leave a comment below, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.